So I like to start with the resources because I tend to forget. One of them is in this book that you all have, the bound book, called Maximizing Your Sales from the Farmers Market Federation of New York. This remains, in my opinion, the best single resource for um, vendors to look at. And, and a lot, if you, after the workshop, you go back and read it, you're going to see a lot of things that were mentioned in the workshop are mentioned in this article. It's, I think it's very useful, very helpful. The second resource is to visit other markets and take notes. Because everything you're going to see in this workshop came from you, came from vendors, came from markets. There's almost nothing new out there. It's all out there waiting for you to find it. So whether you're working on a display or how to market your, your how to talk to customers, all that can, there, there are tons of successful vendors, some of you included, maybe all of you included, who are out there selling what they bought to market and doing it successfully. I captured some of that to share with you today. You can go out and capture it yourself. Um, take notes, find the things that appeal to your product and what you're trying to sell, because that's where the answers are, are out in the markets. I, I don't know, I, I, I always put this in and I don't know why. I guess it just makes me feel good. Um, when you're talking about sales, it's a slippery slope of trying to, you know, sales can be manipulative, sales can be, you know, trying to suggest people to, to buy things they don't want. Um, and that's not what a farmer's market is about, and it's not about what you're about or what this presentation's about. So we're looking for um, matching customers up with a product that they want, need, desire, that appeals to them. It's not about tricking anybody or any sales pitching or anything like that. So you won't see any of that or hear any of that today or not too much. How many experienced vendors do we have? I know we just asked how many vendors we have. How many experienced vendors do we have in the room? Please raise your hands. Three. Okay, so these are the people you want to talk to. Okay. Three experienced vendors in the room. What do you want to sell or what do you sell? Just tell what? What is it? Say something. What do you eggs? I'm making a list of what y'all want to sell or are selling. What else? Jams and herbs. Vegetables, cut flowers. I got the cut flowers. Did you say vegetables? Vegetables. Okay. I'm going to put produce. Anything else? Breads. Sorry? I've got breads. Breads. I'm going to say baked goods. <coughs> More? Great. Ooh, great. Strawberries. Ooh, fruit. Blackberries and blueberries. Fruit is fun. Salves candles. So. Okay. Through the course of this workshop, the next 90 minutes or so, I need to I need to be helpful to each one of you in helping you sell these products. Sometimes in these kind of presentations for a farmer's market, you can get overly emphasized in produce. There'll be a lot of produce pictures. But we'll, we want to, if I'm not helping you sell these things as we talk and as these slides go by, you need to remind me what is up here and say, well, what about my jams? Because you're not telling me about sands. Who, who said soap? Okay, remind, there's a story about soap that happened the last time I did this. I have to tell you. Okay, so remind me more at some point about soap. Okay. And the last one is just sort of a question to, to lead us into the, are you a salesperson? There's two things I want to say about this. One is, as a vendor at a market, you are part of the sales experience. You are part of the display. Okay, this, this young man's part of the display there. Um, the second thing I want to say about this is at the end of the workshop, and as you become more experienced, some of you may already be, you'll, you can come back to the slide and start to see what's wrong with it. I mean, that's not the right thing. What could be better? Okay, not what's wrong with it, because I don't think there's anything really wrong with it. But there are some things that you're, we're going to be talking about as we go through the presentation that when we, if we came back to this slide, you say, ah, wait a minute, should be this, needs that, could be like this, and it would be better. Um, and finally, I want to say, would you buy produce from that person? 
I would. Now, he's not standing at market all day like that. <laughs> you know, obviously, he's posing for the picture. But um, friendly and authentic is part of the fabric of, I believe, and I think most people agree, of farmers' markets. So that's what we're looking for um, in our salespeople, that they be friendly and authentic. So the goal, there can be many goals for markets. There can be goals that vendors have beyond this one. But the goal of this workshop is for you to sell more. It's not, again, it's not about community. It's not about um, getting closer to your food and food access. This, there are many other things that farmers markets have value in terms of why, why they exist and, and the value that they contribute to the community. Today, we're only talking about selling more. And there's three ways to sell more. These are the three ways. The obvious way, and the way that folks <coughs> tend to get preoccupied on, is to attract more customers. Now, typically, I'm a market manager. I, market, I manage the Asheville City Market. It's my job to worry about attracting more customers. But that's only one of the ways. And, and, it, and sometimes it's not the most important way to sell more. Um, go ahead, next. So attracting more customers. Um, there are things that markets do. There are things that can, vendors can do. But actually, it's typically more of a general market activity to do marketing, which is the next workshop, to attract more customers. It's the next two things that you deal with most. Increasing the frequency of visits. So <laughs> if, this is, if this is $1 being spent by this person, and they come once a month, that's your income. Now they're coming four times a month. Now you make $4. So if you, multi if you take your existing customers and can have them move, these are the two extremes, but from once a month to every week, how much are you increasing your sales? You're increasing them dramatically. And this most, um, I shouldn't keep saying most vendors think this. I believe it is common to believe that you don't have, you don't have any control over that. But you do. We're going to talk about some ways that you can get a customer standing in front of you who's handing you some money to come back next week, and come back next week, and come back next week, next. <laughs> so it's a very subtle transition. The other way that you can affect um, sales and your income <coughs> is to take each customer and increase the amount they spend every time they stop. So if you go from $10 to, and by the way, these photos are, are proportionally that increase from 10 to 15, just for dramatic effect. Um, just think in your head how much you sell in a week in a mar at a market. I'm going to just say $500. Um, if, that's, if you can turn that, if you can cut double or, or half again that much, you've now dramatically increased your sales just with the customers who are coming, who are coming to your booth, coming to your space. Um, I always have to stop and think. 80% of your sales come from 20% of your customers. Have you heard that? That's like a sales thing that, right. that's supposed to be true. Um, so you can make it more <coughs> dramatic um, by taking control of this situation and encouraging your customers, not by pressuring them, not by selling them something they don't want, but there, there are ways that, you, and we're going to talk about them a little bit, where you can help your customers um, find more that they want to purchase from you at your booth. Presentation, information, and invitation. These are the three ingredients of selling more, according to my workshop. <laughs> um, so let's go, go ahead. Presentation, color by design. So color is appealing, agreed? I mean, to most people, flowers and other nice colorful things are a draw, they appeal, they're attractive, they're interesting, um, and they're an ingredient in selling more. Not, now, you can walk through a farmer's market where no one has been paying any attention to color, none of the vendors, and it's very colorful. But you as a vendor can turn it up a little bit by doing color by design, and that's what, that's what these images represent. Um, these are actually not too different. It's hard for you to see the color. Can you see it? It's like it's, like it's, it's been matched. I love that picture. These, this is one display, and it's, been, it's not just been set this way by color, it's also by angle and look 
it's just aesthetically pleasing to me. Um, orange carrots on a green checkered background. Um, it's not, you know, some of this just happens. If you put, if, I mean, you can, have a, you can have a basket of white and you can have a basket of purple, but if you put them together, all of a sudden it becomes even more attractive. So again, keep in mind that you need to be, you know, translating this into your own world, your own product base, so that it makes sense for you. And asking me questions about, you know, well, wait a minute, what are you saying there? Because I'm, what am I going to do to mix up the color of my baked goods? You know, that kind of thing. Um, last thing on this, so this arts and crafts vendor here, the colors that are draped behind those pieces of craft, that's not accidental. You know, they intentionally created a visual effect like a, like a, um, a painting, perhaps, to draw folks in. Sometimes you can't put your product out there. It's in the cooler. Uh, various re that's one of the biggest reasons. Um, so you have to have stand-ins. St now that we're, we're in presentation. We talked a little about color. Now I'm talking about stand-ins. So um, this vendor now has pork. What did they have before they had pork? No sign. What do they have? Chicken. Chicken or, and maybe eggs. Um, this is obviously a, a visual display. Um, that is more than the stand and it is the product. These are pastas. Now, of course, all that product is being thrown away at the end of the day. But if you ever walk by the booth where this is being sold, it's a very effective stand in I mean, or representation of what's being sold. And sometimes with things like this, there's a certain product, you, you know, that you, there's a certain amount of product that gets sacrificed for the sake of <coughs> sharing with folks as they go by. Signs like this. Um, these tall chalkboard signs, I see more and more of those, with or without a dog. So um, stand-ins, things that you have to do. So I mean, let's see, what do we got? Let's, meats, you'd have to have a stand-in for meats. Mm, baked goods can be, who has baked goods? Yours are out there, yeah. Eggs can be out there, so there's not a lot of, not a lot of you having a trouble. Not a lot of those products suggest that, the, that you need stand-ins, but you can even do things that are helpful, like uh, for the meats, photo albums, pictures posted of the animals back at the farm, whether the chickens, cows, whatever, or steer, or goats, whatever they are. Again, stand-ins. Okay. It may be that um, the most significant, impactful aspect of presentation is abundance at a farmer's market. Um, whether it's across the table, back to um, bins of uh, tubs of apples, the eggs. Now, you, I, I understand that the eggs you have to be are t temperature sensitive, so that doesn't always work. Um, the marker where this picture was, this photograph was taken, that's across the six foot table like that. Um, now, it's hard. It may be hard in this lighting. How high is this display? Can you see? If I'm standing behind this display, where does it come? Shoulder. shoulder or maybe to my nose. So, okay, I gotta get this saying right. Somebody shared this with me the other workshop I did. St stack it high and watch it fly. So height, this is a, this is a, con well, as you read about marketing and promotions and how to sell more, height is all, almost always there to go high. And sometimes, I mean, I mean, and you can let's make sure check in. I don't know how high you can go with the meats, but you can go high with your baked goods. You can go high with your jams. And I'm not saying you have to go five and a half feet high, but the, the vendors here have to sort of peek out from behind their produce when they're selling and lean to one side to say hi to the customers. It's a very dramatic effect, that level of abundance. Less can be more. Abundance can be, in some ways, an impression more than a reality. Um, here is an abundance of squash. And now this vendor, apparently, by choice, or just based on what they have, mix these things together in a basket that's overflowing. Now there's not a lot there. There's not a lot of product right there. But it sure looks like a lot of product. It doesn't look like the last one. It looks like there's tons of that good stuff waiting for someone to come up and purchase. Same here. 
Um, <coughs> the size of the container, I think this applies, I keep feeling a little self-conscious about this over here, but I'm going to let you guys yell at me if I'm not covering that. The size, because this is obviously a produce example, but the size of these containers affect the visual appeal and the, and the feeling of abundance or the lack of it. So obviously there's one picture on here that's lacking. Because this, on this slide over here, I mean, ask yourself, and this is one of the reasons when you go out and look at vendors and other markets, go as a customer too, not just as a vendor. Where do you, when you walk up to one of these three things, what is most appealing to you? What feels like, oh, that is beautiful. There's lots of that stuff. It's, it must be really good. Um, this needs to be restocked. If you are vending and you walk out in front of your booth and you see what appears to be a loss of abundance or a lack of abundance, you're not doing yourself any favors in terms of attracting customers. One second. Let's go ahead and do the next one to see where I'm at. There are two options when you go to work. They're in this example. You, you go to market, you set up, you sell, and you pack up. Don't raise your hands. Do you do that? Don't raise your hands. You go to market, you set up, you sell, you pack up. Okay, or option two, you set up, you sell, you restock, you reset, you sell, you rearrange, you restock, you reset, and you repeat. There's, there's more to this than me. I mean, this, there's, there's something else about this. Don't let me forget, there's something else about this. This ensures that whatever quality your display had at the beginning of market, it maintains throughout. Whether it's abundance, the mix of color, um, the sample, oh, I shouldn't say sampling, we're not there yet. It all stays the same. So the person that comes at 8 o'clock and the person that comes at 12 o'clock gets the same thing. Now I understand that there are circumstances that may be fortunate that by 12 o'clock you actually don't have enough inventory to, to do this. But if you have it, it needs to be refreshed regularly through market. Um, and the last thing I want to tell you about this, remember I said at the beginning that the vendor is part of the display. Now I can walk through markets I've worked at and visited and count, and I, lo I lose fingers and toes counting how many vendors are, are, are waiting. Do you wait? Sort of sitting back there, not necessarily sitting, but maybe leaning against the truck or the tailgate waiting because they don't want to be pushy. I understand that. I hate, I, I, I would do that. I'd feel like I need to just hang back, let people come to me with their questions. Um, we'll talk about sunglasses in a little bit, uh, but they're, they're sort of hanging back. Um, and then you have other, you walk by other vendors and for some reason they seem like they're always busy. They're coming over here, they're fluffing that up, they're going over here, rearranging, uh, they're checking their inventory, they're talking <coughs> to customers. And, and the truth is, as a customer walking by a booth, which is more attractive to the customer? The vendor that's being busy. Even if they're not really doing anything that has to be done, but they're just kind of moving around and trying to improve their, and trying to make eye contact and say hi, versus the vendor who's, who's respectfully being passive. I'm not saying that in a negative way. I'm just saying, again, this is a little twist that if you're comfortable, so, you know, I'm. I'm not a salesperson, so I'd lean against the truck and wait for folks to come to me, and I, I would feel pushy to go out and say, I mean, but that's the difference between selling this and selling that, selling this and selling that, um, or one of the differences. So if, you, if you're not comfortable engaging, staying busy, making eye contact, I think that you, if you want to sell more, you need to work on that. Time well spent. Yes. Uh, this, is, this is another display of some uh, product that needs some time well spent on it. Um, otherwise, it's going gonna, it's gonna to diminish in, in the impact that it has as folks walk by. Yes. Be creative. Um, you know, it, we're all silly to different degrees. You know, silliness is not a bad thing. You know, somebody walks by and they say, yeah, it's cute and it tastes good too. You know, it's like, okay. Um, cracker Attic, what does he sell? Crackers. <laughs> this is my favorite because if I was shopping, I tend to use myself as an example maybe too much, but if I were shopping and looking for some house plants, I would go to that sign and make sure that I checked out what she has for sale. Um, it's a sense of humor, but it's also a mechanism to, um, because, because there's a lot of people out there who would be interested in that. So it's another way of bringing folks to the table to engage them in a discussion of what 
might appeal to them or what, what they might want to purchase. I don't know how you can see this. Um, this is another hard to display item. This is shrimp. Um, and I know that, that vendor from our market a few years ago. And I don't recommend that you all go out and buy a, a, a Harley and make a part of your display. But he did. I mean, he, he wanted a Harley anyway. But anyway, he got one. And then he got this neat little rig. Can you see it? This the little rig with the umbrella in the back. Um, and this is just about being creative. He had a typical booth for two years. Tent, table, can't display the shrimp because it's frozen. I got shrimp, come on up. You know, he did okay. How did he do when he did this? He did better. His sales significantly increased when he did this. Again, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't the product. It wasn't him. It was the presentation. Be creative. There's, you, and, and, and the creativity is already out there. So if you're not... If you don't feel particularly creative or you feel in a rut or you feel stuck with your product because you've lived with it, worked with it, grew it, baked it, prepared it for years and years and years and you feel that you're just stuck being creative, slide number one, go out to markets and, and look around because the creativity is out there. There are tons of, of cool ideas out there um, in addition to motorcycles. Presentation, information. What? <coughs> Invitation. All right. Information. I mean, perhaps the most obvious part of information is sign, our signs. Um, this particular vendor's signs are almost as, as appealing as the product. She's put a lot of effort into labeling all of her plants. It may be difficult to see, but these, are, these labels are in different colors. They offer information beyond just the basic or the minimum, which is required. What's the minimum required on any sign? Name and price. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Name and price. But she's got some extra stuff in here. Um, so this inf more information, sign and label information, is, is good. Now, you, there could be situations. I mean, if there's any situation where there's too much information, this might begin to look like it, but I don't think so. I think the way it lends itself to her, her display and her presentation and what she's selling to go ahead and do this much information. And even though someone isn't going to stop and read every sign, something might catch their eye, and then they can begin to be drawn into the booth and drawn into a potential purchase by reading this information. Some signs are, um, and labels, signs and labels, are, can be done professionally, where they're, they're printed and they're very pretty and they're very uh, professional. Um, some can be handwritten. There, there's, no, there's no reason that they have to be one or the other. They're conveying information. And they def I'm not telling you that all of your signs have to be pre-printed, you know, covered <coughs> over with plastic and changed every week and made all precise and pretty. They can be handwritten, but they have to be here. Here's some, here's some signage that's not really price. It's, it's Appalachian grown twist tags that have been put around them. Um, more information to the customer is better. Again, this is a good example of the tall sign. Um, this is the pasta vendor, and um, she has on either side of her booth. You know, the pasta. The pasta is on display that you saw earlier is on display on this table, but right now you can't see it. So if you're a shopper walking by, you won't you won't be able to be attracted to those examples of pasta that are sitting on the on the dish in the center. Um, so she has these large signs that indicate what is for sale. They're done in chalk, and as you see, when something sells out, she walks out and crosses it off. Which is in itself kind of an interesting little attractiveness. Uh-oh, <laughs> wait a minute. No, no, this one, I want that one. I better, you know, I better get in there. Anyway, go ahead, next. This display has two sets of signs, and they repeat the same information. They've got the signs with the price and the name of the product at each product's location. That's the minimal that you would do. But they've also created a whiteboard up here, which repeats all the information that's down here below. And again, this could apply to anything where you, when someone moves into your booth, they're starting to block the information now from the customers passing by or stopping to take a look. Now, this booth can be and is full of people. I 
many times this booth gets full of people. And no one can really even see necessarily what's at the front, at, at the in, most inner part of the, of the display, uh, what the labels say, but now they can glance up and see. And they can also, just as in the previous slide, start to cross things off as they sell out. It's a small thing, but it's, it's, it's another little, because all of these suggestions that I'm sharing with you today that really came from your fellow vendors make incremental differences in your sales. If there was a magic one that doubled your sales like that, you'd all already know about it. These are all these little incremental changes that you make. So the fact that, is it a big deal? Does everybody need to have two sets of signs? No, but it's, it's a little bit of an edge now to have additional information displayed mm -hmm. where even the people walking by when the booth is full of customers can see what you have, see what the price is, see what's sold out, what's still available. Go ahead. More information is better. Oh, this was the one I was looking for. What is this? What's that? <laughs> I tease Hamidi Valley about her artistic what is this an image of? Yeah, yeah, it is. It's a cow or a steer. Um, so here you have how many Valley Farms indicating some what are, may be important to customers, characteristics of their meat. This is on a display board at the front of their booth, along with some other information about the farm. This one, this is wild salmon. Um, there are a whole lot of people, me included, who will stop and look at that map. Just because it's a map. I mean, I just like to look at maps and go, wait, that's Alaska. Where, where are we here? Um, and this gentleman and, the, and his, and, um, his co-vendor, who both fish and catch the salmon, will talk to you about where they fish, get into a discussion with you about salmon here, salmon there, what's happening up in Alaska this season, um, <coughs> what the situation is. So this is like... Um, this is like, like gold. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a display that just attracts people's attention, is a conversation starter. You're not tricking anybody, you're just engaging them, offering them something to bring them in and, and, and see what, if what you have appeals to them and they're interested in making a purchase. This is an arts and crafts vendor. What are they selling? <coughs> socks. Yeah, socks. We're going to see her a little bit later. Um, so what is the purpose of it? I mean, there's no, there is no, this is just eye appeal. This is just fun. This is just stuff I've got that sort of relates to what I do, to my craft, uh, sock monkeys, yarn, just sort of f a fun arrangement of stuff. But as somebody walks by, you see the sock monkey, you see somebody you walk, you take a glance again. It's, in some way, I guess, that maybe this doesn't, this is maybe more of a visual sampling thing. We'll get to that in a minute. Because um, it's not really providing information. Well, I guess it is. I guess, because you knew what it was. Yarn or socks. Can you read this one? Fresh young ginger. I can't read it. Th thin skin, tender, fleshy. Refrigerate, wrapped in paper towel. Freeze and use frozen as needed. They look like they did that that morning, that they just yanked out a piece of paper and a pen and wrote that. Um, this kind of information, you know, recipes and, and, and care and how to take care of it, how to preserve it, how to use it, um, more information is better. <clears throat> a lot of folks are going to walk by and appreciate this little bit of in, insight about the ginger. Oh, I got a lot of ginger. Now you could freeze it keeps really well. You can freeze it for the X number of weeks. And when you pull it back out, it'll be just as good as when you bought it. Things like that. What's next? Is this making sense? Is this your experience? Does this work for you? Yes. I know that when uh, I had a store, we did a lot of this. You know, somebody came in and bought product constantly, restocked, reorganized, color, color coordinated, everything. Does, it does make a difference. And if I just had a little bit of something because it sold down, I put it in a smaller container to make it look like it was more. Yes. I love it. People like things that I love. They don't have to, they don't like to look down. They don't they want it. I love it. So These are things a that a lot of things that you're saying is a lot to do with any type of retail. So and the not thing just <coughs> not just farmers markets. Right. It, 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 
yeah, the thing about so much of this is it makes so much sense once you see it. And maybe, maybe for some of you who've been there and done this, you know, this is, maybe some of this is like old Howdy, you already knew about it. But as a new market manager a few years ago, I've over time become more and more appreciative of those little things that make a difference that are so obvious once you see them that you don't know why you didn't notice it in the first place or think of it in the first place or put it, make it part of your uh, booth. And now I'm going to do my gas station thing, which I wasn't going to do. But go into a gas station store and look for a piece of candy. How many linear feet of candy is there in a <coughs> gas station store? And, and I'm not saying that you should pattern your market booth after a gas station candy aisle. But my point about this is to, is to reflect what you said. There's a reason why there's 10 feet of candy on either side, and then there's another section of candy over here. And the reason there's that much candy, and there's some more candy over here, is because that's, that works. That's why it's that way. It's not because gas station stores just love candy. Um, and it's partly because if you walk into that with candy, you're bound to find something, that, which is probably part of the answer. You're bound to find something that you want, even if you don't need it. Yes? <laughs> Put them in a bag. Yep. <laughs> so that that before we go on to the the last section, um, in terms of invitation, that is a really helpful reminder of something else that came up about soaps that I want to tell you. Um, so I want to retreat a little bit to the abundance is great. So the last time I did this workshop, there was a soap vendor, and he and he said, look, I put ten soaps out there. Ten. I've got ten varieties of soap. I put them out there. And I thought. Just like the candy in the gas station store, people are going to just find something they want. And what happened? Too much soap. I can't pick. You know, you, only, you don't have a lot of time. People are, you know, they wander up to your table and they go, okay, there's 10, bar 10 different kinds of soap here. What do I want? You know, I need to get some broccoli and I need to get some eggs. You know, I don't know. I just walk away. That was his experience. So then he experimented and he put four bars of soap out. He picked four. I'm sure he rotated. He didn't say this, but I imagine that he did. And what happened to his sales? Went up. They went up. So the, the message there is this. Because there, that's, that is a complete contradiction of the suggestion I made earlier that abundance rules, that abundance is the most important thing. I sort of suggested that that may be true. Um, not for the soap vendor. Not for that soap vendor. So, Everybody stop thinking about anything I said and anything I'm going to say and think about this. You have to experiment with your product. Okay? Because your market, your customers, your product may not follow these rules, these suggestions. It may actually, if that guy was putting out four bars of soap and he came here and said, I should put out 10, his sales would have gone down. So you need to experiment. I mean, the experienced vendors in the room, and I'm not going to call you out, do you track your sales? Sure. Do you track what sells? Sure. Do you track, do you track if you put it over here, or put it over there, put it in the front of the booth, put it in the back of the booth, put it in a bag or leave it in a bulk? What sells better? I'm not saying you do this all in one week. But over time, as important as going out and looking at other vendors and seeing what they're doing, the next most important thing is experimenting with your product and trying it in different ways. Because if it's static and you're only doing it one way, you, you don't know what you're missing. You don't know what appeal nut you're missing from the customers going by. And that's a perfect example of putting, this, putting the candles <coughs> in a bag. Same candles, can't even see them now, they're in a bag, and boom, there they go. The sampling, the sampling work? Yes. yes. Study after study shows that sampling works. If you sample your product, you'll improve your sales. Now, I understand if it's a frozen chicken. Well, I was trying to think of a better example. Actually, a frozen chicken is not a good example because you can sample the chicken. You can cut it up and put it on a pan and start frying it up and sample it that way. Um, but sampling, they show that sampling improves sales. This is the classic view of sampling. You get to put it in your mouth. You get to you know, put the toothpick in the honey and taste it, uh, have a slice of, of produce, a piece of cheese, 
a taste of bread. That's, that's the classic, that is what everybody thinks about, what I think about when I think about sampling. I think about putting it in my mouth and seeing how it's taste. But there are other kinds of sampling. There's, can you, is the video going to pick me up? I should refer to the video, I'm sorry. The sense of smell can be used to sample. I mean, this, and, and um, this is actually trout that's been fried up. So you're smelling that. I mean, you, you get to taste it, but before you get to taste it, you get to go, well, it's that I smell. You know, you wander over because they're, they're frying that up there and that aroma is coming out into the, into the uh, market space. There's taste, there's smell, and there's visual sampling. This is one of my favorite slides, a ear of corn. It's, you're not tasting it, you're not smelling it, you're just seeing it. But you, everybody, maybe it's just me, doesn't everybody come up and want to look at every one of them before they stick it in the, wait a minute, has this one got something I don't want? They peel it, peel it back to see if it's got all those nice kernels. So why not just, un just pe un I mean, this is, grocery stores do this, unpeel, you know, peel it back and show people, and then they go, oh, look at that. I bet you they all look like that. Visual sampling. <laughs> well, I mean, they probably all do look like that. Um, so sampling is not simply tasting. You can use the senses, you can use any senses. You, I, I haven't come up with a sound sampling yet. I'm sure there's one out there. You should think about that and let me know if you think of something. We, well, yeah, there are, but there are some out there where you could use sound as a sample. We do have, that reminds me, we do have a jeweler who brings his little anvil and will pound out his, start pounding on his, on his, on his silver and all working it right there. So there you go. There's also sound sampling, or at least it's attention getting if it's not sampling. Okay, next. Nice. Demos. This is the, um, the woman with the socks, and she has some sort of uh, old antique sort of sock maker. I don't even know what it's called. Maybe it's called a sock maker. And she, as she's in her booth, because she doesn't want to just sit there and stare at people walking by, she'll start doing some socks while and people will go by and go, what are you doing? I'm, doing some, I'm making these socks that you see hanging all around, around the tent right now. Um, simple recipes can be done. Again, we're talking about sampling now, not prepared foods. Uh, plant care, we just had our, this is actually part of, we just had our plant day at the market, and one of the, demo, one of the, one of the um, demos was that the um, starts, the live starts, and the tree vendors, and the nurseries, and all, would do some little demo in front of their booth. You know, how to repot a tree, how to prune a Japanese maple without making it look <coughs> awful when you're done. Um, demos, yes. Okay, uh, multiple choice. Which of these is the best way to um, address someone if you're a cheese vendor? A, B, or C? You don't want to ask because they can say no. If you say, would you like to try some cheese, there's a good chance they're gonna say no. Right? So you don't, you know, if they don't want to try the cheese, they don't want to try the cheese, they're not gonna try the cheese. But you don't want to start off on the, giving them the option of an easy no. Now, I'm not, that sounds like pressure. Sorry, I take that one back. You want to frame it in such a way where you keep the conversation, keep the interaction alive as long as you can, hoping that that person actually would like to taste your cheese and would be interested in purchasing them. Have you tasted our cheese? Eh, yes, no. Those aren't good. It's the last one. I credit Three Graces Farm for this. Every day, every market, have some cheese. It's just you walking by, have some cheese. Now that's that's an invitation that doesn't require an answer. I mean, they're going to if they don't want the cheese, they're going to walk away. But the third approach, the sales, what I am referring to as sales speech, have some cheese has the likeliest chance of actually getting someone to come over and taste the cheese who's borderline. Those that don't want to will walk on. Those who are going to taste it anyway, good for you. But this is the one that will get the borderline people to actually pause and not be able to politely say, no, thank you, I just brushed my teeth, and walk away, <laughs> which is more common than you might think. <laughs> Next one. Can you get anything else? See, that's like, why wouldn't you say that? Of course you'd say that. I would say that. Can I get you anything else? Not the best answer. Not the best way to end up. To, you're doing a transaction. They're buying a candle. They're buying some bread. They're buying some produce. They're buying some meat. Can I get you anything else? You probably hear that more than anything else out in the world because it makes sense. It's polite. 
Why wouldn't you say it? What else can I help you with? Now begins to cheat that interaction a little bit towards because maybe you want to buy something else. Maybe you want to come from a $10 a purchase customer to a $15 purchase customer. Remember going back there how we're trying to increase sales? This is one of the ways that you can engage folks to move them from I spend $10 with you every week to I spend 15 or 20 or 25 with you every week. What else can I help you with? Have you noticed? Look over here, this ginger we just got. I have a new scent of candle. I'm trying a new baked, a new bread. This is my new bread, would you like to sample it? What else can I help you with followed immediately by, here's what, here's what you might be interested in. There's Old Turtle Farm does this. She, Eileen does it with every customer. And um, go to the Asheville City Market or wherever Old Turtle is and watch what happens. I know I haven't done a special survey on this or account, but I guarantee you that this response that she gives, this engagement that she does with her customers, leads to additional sales. Because now she's pointing out stuff. And, and the nice thing is, is as you start to know your customers a little bit, you can start to, you know, if you can, I don't know that I could do this, but sort of file away a little bit. Oh, that's right. I remember that this person really likes this. Did you see we just had this? There's only a few left. It's right over here. Maybe you didn't notice. Um, it's not, I said, take, you know, it's not pressure. It's not, it, it's service. It's a service that has a pay, a pay off for you as well and, and for the customer because they will just, if they buy something, that means that it did appeal to them. It was something that they were interested in. They just weren't paying attention. So you're really, you're really just directing attention to places where to items or other options that can increase your sales from here to there on one customer. I mean, obviously, any of these is a good greeting. But one of them has to be there. I, if you want to keep that customer from going, you're too busy, I'm going down the aisle now. I'll be right with you. You know, you're, you're doing a transaction, you're talking to somebody, you say, I'll be right with you. Oh, just a second. You have to say something. Hello? Whatever you want to say. What's the best? The best, if your memory is better than mine, is to say hi. Hi, Jess. Nice to see you today. Um, there's, I mean, the, this, this relates also to the fabric of our farmers' markets and the sense of community, connectedness to your local foods, your local products, your local producers. The fact that one of the attractions of farmers markets, as I'm sure you all know, is that face to face, your hand, you know, I collected these eggs that you're buying with this hand, you know, this morning or yesterday. Um, that's part of the appeal. So the more connected that you can become to your customers, um, the more that spirit will spill over into, um, this sounds very mercenary, more sales, but that's what we're talking about. Next. Um, thank you, politeness is good. Thank you, see you next week. That's sort of expressing a hope. Thank you, I'll see you next week. Um, but thank you, I'll see you next week. And, and next week, this is what I'm gonna have. Now you're, now you're getting to that other one. If they come once a week, once a month, or they come four times a month, you have some control over that, or at least you have some influence over it. You, have, you can have some impact on it <laughs> by inviting them back with something you think that would be appealing for them to come back next week and see, and buy, and consider. Even if it's all the same stuff. You're not going to have anything new next week. But you're going to do something new next week. You're going to do something that, because you've planned this now. Next week, even though I've got these, I've got these 15 products out here, next week that one is going to be over there, and it's going to be in a special little display. And I'm, I never suggest that you discount your product. Okay. And I could go off on another topic there, but but you could do something with the you could uh, buy three get you know you could do some little thing with it. I uh, very much discourage you from discounting your pro unless by unless when you discount it you improve your sales and I mean your body your net, not just the thing going out the door. And there I'm digressing now, but there's this came up in the last workshop. We had a long conversation about whether something at seven seven dollars a pound and then you break it into quarter pounds and sell it for $2? Did that add up right? Because now it's $8 a pound, right? That, that the experience a person had, would people would go, I'm not paying $7 a pound for that. 
but I'll pay two dollars a pound for a quarter pound. <laughs> so all I'm saying is, what am I saying? Even if, even if during the course of the weeks, you're not necessarily having something new that you can say. Now, if you are having something new, and I'm running like a new jam, uh, produce is kind of, you know, you'll, over the course of a season, you'll have <coughs> new things come in for produce. So that's, but again, repackage, re refocus, refeature, so that, do that every week so that you can say, and um, by the way, next week, I'm going to have a, a special on this. Again, th th a special doesn't mean that you're discounting the price. A special just means that you're, you're calling it special and you're giving it some special treatment and you want them to know that they should pay attention to that and come back next week to see it. What's next? Unspoken impacts. Next, go ahead, next. For, ex for example, <laughs> Um, if we go back to, in your mind to the first slide of the, of the young man with his arms embracing his product and welcoming him into his booth with a big smile, um, I challenge you to go around markets and find how many of these you can count. A vendor who's standing sort of to the back of their market with their arms folded, a classic, you know, or sunglasses on, okay, a classic sort of barrier builder, um, or, or at least, maybe that's too strong, that's too strong. It's not as appealing. It's not as approachable to come up to a vendor who is, you know, hanging back. I, I cut the person's head off because it's a vendor I know, and I don't want them in this PowerPoint being using this kind of example. Make eye contact. Is this this is so uh, basic? I but make eye contact, listen, and acknowledge your customer's smile, stay active and engaged. Things I've already commented on, um, but. Whether or not, I'm not a psychologist, I don't know what body language is, good body language is what body language, you know, other than just my personal feeling about it. But there are ways of being, ways of acting, ways of standing, ways of looking. If 60% of communication is by nonverbal cues, then there are cues that make you approachable, the cues that make you someone that someone would like to feel comfortable talking to, and there are cues that says, stay away from me, I'm grouchy, stay away from me, I don't really want to talk to you, I just want you to buy my stuff, and other kinds of cues. So, so I don't know how helpful this is because, I, like I said, I don't have the list of, here, stand like this, look like this, do that. I mean, some of this is common sense, I think. Um, looking stern versus looking pleasant are obvious. Um, but again, as I said earlier, the vendor is part of the display. They're not just, whenever I walk, I, whenever I walk up, maybe I'm using myself too much, but whenever I walk up to a booth, I look at the vendor first, and then I look at the product. I want to see who I'm going to be dealing with first, and then maybe that's just me, but I bet you that's really common, that people do pay attention to who's behind the booth, and how, they're going to, how that makes them feel before they walk up. Because there's a lot of options out there. This isn't the only place that has tomatoes. This is the only place that has, well, maybe it is the only place that has bread. I don't know at your market. But there, there are other places they can go. And, and I've, seen this hap I've seen this happen. I've actually heard it happen, where people will turn away and go somewhere else, not because of the product, but because of the vendor. Go ahead. Buy more options. This is kind of, this is kind of that in a bag effect, with the, except now it's not candles. Um, Not a, you, this doesn't, well, I was going to say this doesn't apply to everyone, but maybe you could tweak it and figure out how it applies. Options on how to buy. Um, there, there's a whole box. Buy a whole box of sweet potatoes, $30. And I bet you there's, I mean, there has to be sweet potatoes on sale by the pound. There might be even some prepackaged sweet potatoes by the bag. Um, I like this one. Fill your, this empty box. Pick the chocolate and fill it out. Fill it up. You, you know. You don't just buy one, buy six. And here's your box. Just here, and, and it's, again, I have a feeling that this is, this is cheaper than buying them each individually, but I bet you this is not discounted to the point where the, the vendor's now losing <coughs> profit on that. They're still doing okay, even though they've reduced the price to increase the, the, the numbers of um, pieces that are going in the box. In the, you know, we had two vendors. We have two vendors, but early on we had one Apple vendor. And the way the Apple vendor sold apples was, um, which one do you want, and how much, how much, how many pounds do you want? 
So I'd like some of these over here. The vendor would pull it, weigh it, put it in the bag, and, and give it to the person. And that remained unchanged until the second after Apple vendor came. And the second Apple vendor had these big metal tubs of each variety of Apple spread out around their, their vendor space and hand you the bag, a peck, a hat, whatever size it was, and says, here, fill your bag with apples. And the, the first vendor switched to that method. Why? Because this vendor was selling more that way. Um, and, not, and, and the thing that tickles me about this is I've seen this happen over and over again. Say this apple's not in the bag, the vendor will go, oh, there's more room in there. Put that other apple in there. And now they're getting a gift. It's like the, the, the customer's just feeling like warm all over because you're giving me, you're making, you know, they're not, they're not trying to keep the, you know, just to the very top. No, put another apple in there. Um, and this, this also leads, this option thing, I sort of suggested it with the sweet potatoes. The, you, you can't give options that, would, that keeps everybody happy. You can't give like 10 choices because you've got 10 people who say, I want it this way, I want it this way. But you can spread it out a little bit. So you have the folks who come up who would find this appealing. I, I assume that this is a price that beats the price per pound. Um, you, you will also have, now this may not be true at your markets, it's true at the Asheville City market. You'll have customers who come up who don't even know what a pound of something looks like. They go, I got a pound of beans, I don't have a pound of beans. I'm one of them, okay, I'm a farmer's market, maybe you think I'd know better. What's a pound, whatever it is. It's a pound of these, I don't know how much is a pound, it's seven dollars a pound, but I don't know what a pound looks like. Oh, here's these little containers, that can, oh, I can take that home, that's enough for me. Me and my wife, we can have that for a meal, a little up, whatever. Um, Price isn't the only thing that determines how well something sells. Convenience is also very important. Um, so that's, some people want bulk, maybe they have a big family, they're, trying to, they're on a budget, they're trying to buy something at the, at the most affordable price that they can. Some people, um, not that they don't care about money or costs, but they're more drawn, the, the trade off for them is I'd rather have the convenience of, of having you having packaged up, you, you know, their salad mix. As a, I, I just want to buy that. It's like, okay, yeah. I can make a, I know exactly what that is. It's four dollars and I know exactly how that's going to fit as I'm cutting it up on the cutting board to put it in a salad. Um, so options. Um, toy with your product. Um, okay, I have to say this about soap. I, I just looked over here and I saw soap. Um, we have a soap vendor who cuts the bars of soap into little bitty bits as a sample and hands it out. That's just crazy how many people will take that soap. It's this little piece of soap and they go, here, have a piece of soap. And it's like, oh, okay. And they put it in their pocket. It doesn't melt. It doesn't you know, go bad. Anyway, that's a complete, that goes back to some slides a little bit before on sampling. Um, what I was trying to figure out when I was looking at this is if this applies to your, you know, it's hard to take, uh, well, that's not. I was going to say it's hard to take a whole chicken and offer it in different ways, but then again, you do. I mean, you, there are cuts of meat and other things like that. Who, who am I not helping here? Everyone. Isn't that nice? <laughs> no. Okay. Next one. <coughs> this, is, this is clever. How do you buy peppers? You open your hand with the palm facing down. You reach into the pepper bowl. You close your hand. You pull your hand out. This is your hand full of peppers, and there's the price. Now, there's, that's just a little goofy, okay? Um, but it's kind of, you know, I can see people going, you know, I, uh, I got a big hand. Watch me get, <laughs> I'm going to get in and get some peppers here. I don't know. Obviously, obviously, that wasn't the only way you could buy peppers at this booth. But it's fun. Um, and it's another option that's creative. Um, I just, I don't know. I feel like, it, yeah, I'd like to reach in there and grab some peppers. A buck, a buck 50 a reach, it's like a, a like a, like an arcade game or something. I'm going to reach in. All right, what's the next one? Some of this, I think, um, has already been shared. But it's worth reminding you that it's your job, as well as the market managers and the market marketing person's job, to bring these people back as often as possible. Um, we talked about the weekly previews, a listing of your product, and what this is referring to, a list of what's coming sort of thing. 
the see you next week and what can I help you with and I've got something special coming next week. Um, frequent shopper cards is really, you can do this as an individual vendor. I've seen it more often, well, no, actually that's true. It's like, you know, going to get into a coffee shop and you get the little, you know, the coffee thing punched every time you get a coffee. Um, frequent shopper cards, again, none of these are magic, none of these are silver bullets when now you see your sales go double in a week. These are the incremental things that you begin to introduce over time that hopefully build your sales as they have, as they have an impact on your customers. Um, everybody understands what frequent shopper cards are. <coughs> we talked about increasing the size of the purchase from a, a customer comes up and buys $10 and says, how can I get them to buy 15 Is there a way that would facilitate them actually purchasing more every time they stop? We talked about getting folks to come back every week rather than once a month or every other week. And this is the sort of the classic more customer one. Um, these are, honestly, these are sort of weak. I don't have a lot of confidence in these because I haven't tried them. Although we have some things going on that I'm going to talk about in the marketing workshop that I think are promising. Um, so these are, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have a lot to say about these. You know, bring a friend. Haven't seen it done. Has anybody seen it done? You know, bring a friend promotion or, you know, yeah. Neighborhood specials, group specials. I don't have a lot of enthusiasm for those ideas. But the point of it is, um, we, it is not just the market manager's job. It's not just the market's job to attract more customers. Um, well, there, I mean, the sharing by email and the these are word of, I'm gonna, I don't want to get into marketing, so we'll stop there. If you can think of a way to give your customers an incentive or uh, inspire them to invite their neighbors or their other family members or their coworkers to the market, if you can think of a way to do that, let me know and I'll add it to the slide here. Yeah, thanks. <coughs> Is this the same slide we started? No, it's a different one. So step back and evaluate. So if you <coughs> process what's been shared today in these slides, read that Maximizing Your Sales article, go and visit other markets and see what they're doing, you will now get a keener eye and, 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 a, and a better judgment to look at something and go, okay, how, and this is yours now, don't just go, go out and evaluate everybody else's. Go out and step out in front of yours and pretend you're a customer. And, and, and have, those, have some notes saying, do I do this? And stand out in front of your own booth and try to, and start to and step back and evaluate what you're doing and see where you can start making these changes. Not all at once, this is too, where everybody's too busy and there's too much going on, you, get, you work too hard, you get you know, too many hours, too few hours in the day to, to take these things on all at once. Just pick one that you, th that you thought was particularly fun or helpful or you thought, I bet you that will make a difference, and then each week or each month or each season or each year, start to fold these into what you're trying to do to, so, that, so that the opportunity for incremental increases in your sales will build over time. We're, I think we're getting close to this. Um, this is a fun picture. This is our indoor market this winter. There's the apple vendor with all the tubs of apples. This is like art. This is a baker viewed from above. I like that. Here's someone who's just isn't even set up. He just he just bought his greens and opened the cooler. Um, so there's all kinds of things going on. Cheese sampling. Um, that must be the plant vendor with the. I think this is meats down here. No, that's the coffee vendor. I can't see it. Anyway, visit markets takes notes. What's next? See you next week. You're sold out. <laughs> This is my, can you see his face? <laughs> you can't because it's, it's not dark enough. Can you see the smug little look on his face? <laughs> this is Pete. Um, Pete's got a sign. Pete, he uses an umbrella, which makes, also makes it, him different than the other vendors. It's kind of fun. Um, he's got his little tubs sitting out with his produce and everything in it. Um, very, he's a very sweet person, very approachable, and more of everything next week. He's inviting you back because he's sold out. Made possible with funding from the North Carolina Community Transformation Grant Project and Centers for Disease Control and Prevention.